we're all set. So the okay. next presentation will be given by Gitan. Please go on. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Eugenie. Yeah, so this work is uh, titled In Memory Hyperdimensional Computing. I am Geetan Karunaratne. Uh, I'm a doctoral student uh, uh, working at IBM Research and uh, at ETH Zurich. Um, and uh, this work, uh, I, I have also uh, a great uh, set of supervisors who helped me through this project. So I would like to mention them, Manuel Legalo, Giovanni Cherubini, Luca Benini, Abbas Rahimi, and Abu Sebastian. To, so first, I would like to uh, give you an idea what in-memory hyperdimensional computing means, um, what we mean by this. So it's basically um, uh, two broader domains put together. On one side, we have the in-memory computing. On the other side, we have the hyperdimensional computing. So the, the, the in-memory computing is somewhat uh, a distant uh, domain to uh, the audience of the, today's talk. So I'd take a bit of time at the beginning to uh, explain the idea of in-memory computing. So the idea is that we will perform the, uh, the, the arithmetic and logical operation on an array of memory devices. Uh, one typical example, as you can see here on the, on the graph here, um, on the slide here is um, um, to perform a matrix vector multiplication. So uh, the idea is that you will uh, program the array of memory devices to the, the matrix that you want to multiply with. So um, you program in, in a, some property like the conductance of the memory, de memory device, um, for example, uh, and then you will apply the, 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 in, the, the input vector uh, which you want to multiply with as a set of voltages along the word lines of the, the memory array uh, of this crossbar. And then um, you will receive the current along the bit lines of the of the memory array and these currents will be uh, uh, equal to the equivalent to the 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 output vector that you would expect in this multiply uh, matrix vector multiply operation so if you go a little bit closer into this uh, array you will see uh, one of these devices can be uh, made out of uh, a certain memory device in this particular work we look at the this uh, memory stew device uh, which is called phase change memory uh, and the way the phase change memory works is that it will um, change its structure from one state to the other by applying a certain um, um, electrical pulse so for example it can be at the beginning in a reset, reset state which has a structure which looks more like an, an amorphous uh, material uh, with a more irregular uh, structure and once we apply a certain uh, shaped pulse electrical pulse into the device, it will change its structure to a more regular uh, crystalline state, uh, which we call the set set. And then if we apply another pulse um, in a different shape, we can get the, the previous um, um, previous state again. So uh, when you're in, in, the, in the amorphous phase, uh, we, we generally the, the, the conductance property of the device is low. Uh, when you are in the crystalline state, the, the conductance of the device is high. So we have exploit these uh, uh, properties when it's changing the conduct, uh, the electrical properties, we exploit these in, in making the in-memory computing to work. But uh, there's one catch here. So the, 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 the memory devices typically have their own non-idealities. As you can see here in this graph, um, there is a, um, a device to device variability that we'll typically see in this kind of uh, memory array. So for example, if we try to program these devices to a certain conductance level, uh, depending on the programming method you follow, they, they would not achieve the, the exact same conductance level. So they will have initially different conductance level to start with. And then over a period of time, their values will um, start to drift to a lower state to get more uh, due to uh, their structural um, um, evolutions like uh, structural relaxation relaxation we call it so due to these um, um, issues their conductance states tend to change over time and also within a short period of time you will also see some um, stochasticity which means that it's not uh, following a linear curve so it can also have some stochasticity also built into the, the, the devices. Uh, 
So uh, in, in summary, we have a set of amazing properties that um, enables us to enables this in-memory computing to um, drive the, the, um, uh, uh, the computing technology. Uh, for example, there is low read latency and there's very low uh, read energy for these devices. And they also demonstrate very high endurance up to 10 to the power 12 programming cycles. And it's also shown to be really scalable with up to thousand elements being able to be um, um, put in one dimension of the array. Uh, and this are also um, easily, we can fabricate at high density. Um, and these memories, of course, uh, where they are non-volatile, which means they do not need any power to keep their state. They can retain the state at no power. But as you, as I was saying earlier, there are these negative um, properties, uh, non-ideal properties, uh, like the drift, the read noise, and it also takes a lot of programming power to uh, pro uh, power to program the devices and the, the amount of instructions that we can uh, perform in this kind of memory cross by arrays is limited. So these are the downsides to it. So uh, moving to the other side of the story, we have uh, this hyperdimensional computing part of it, which is uh, uh, somewhat similar to uh, the audience of this uh, talk. So I'll try to quickly go over uh, with an, um, a language classification example to explain to you how hyperdimensional computing works. So at the start, we have a, a corpus of text in the case of language classification. Uh, which is written from, um, let's say, a Latin alphabet. So we have the letters starting from A going up to Z. And these letters we can map to a project and randomly into a high dimensional vector, each of them, which we call the basis vectors. And these vectors we store in the uh, item memory. And uh, it has been shown that um, as we increase the dimensionality of the vector, um, uh, doing a random projection of these, uh, these vectors will uh, make the, the, these representations of each of these vectors um, stay dot orthogonal to each other. So we explain this property uh, to um, build on top of this, um, uh, this computing paradigm uh, where we can now create um, um, for further representations, for example, we can create uh, representations for uh, uh, letter, C, letter um, tuples, uh, for example, uh, as they appear in the text. So these uh, three tuples I show here from three different languages that as they typically appear. So um, th we create uh, high dimension representations for these um, tuples, uh, we call the n-grams, um, using certain set of algebraic operations in this case, uh, to create a high dimension representation for three, three letters I, C, H, we use an um, 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 XNOR operator to bind the letters and then to encode the position, we use a permit operation, which is a, a shift operation of the, the high dimensional vector. And once we have the, this intermediate rep, um, uh, high dimensional vector representation, we can uh, bundle them in the next stage to create uh, uh, a certain representation uh, for the, the, the prototype vectors. So the prototype vectors, uh, in this case, they represent uh, di different languages, um, German, English, or Italian, as they appear, uh, as, uh, as these engrams appear in a certain language. So here we will uh, by bundle these um, in the intermediate n-gram representations using a sum operator. And in the end, we apply a threshold uh, to get uh, the final representation back in the uh, high dimensional binary uh, space. So uh, finally, what we do is uh, during the inference, we go through the, the same procedure. Uh, we get a sentence from an unknown language and we we map them uh, we, based on the symbols as they appear in the, the unknown, the, the sentence from the unknown language, we get their high dimensional representations. And then we will uh, create the n-gram representations. And from there, we can create a hyper, a hyper vector that represents the, the query sentence. And now we will calculate the, the distances from the query vector to each of the, the prototype hypervectors 
and these distances we typically calculate using Hamming distance. Um, uh, in the case of uh, high dimensional binary uh, representation. So here also we see uh, very nice amazing properties uh, that uh, this uh, that is appealing in the high, high dimensional computing um, domain. For example, this uses very few uh, simple instructions to perform all these operations. Uh, the, the operations are also very local. Um, and the, this whole um, uh, paradigm is inspired by the by the how the brain works. So, for example, um, we um, try to represent the the the, the entities uh, using um, this pseudo orthogonal uh, uh, representations. Uh, and at the time of inference, these hypervectors are um, fixed. So the item memory. The, the hypervectors we keep in the item memory uh, are already fixed and the, the uh, hypervectors we keep in the associative memory are also fixed during the inference time. And of course, this, uh, this uh, entire computing scheme is very robust because of its distributional representation. If some of the components, um, uh, the values of the sum of components fail, um, it would not have a, um, a failing impact on, on the on the outcome. But on the other side, we see that this entire uh, entire paradigm is um, uh, offers us a uh, challenge because now we have to calculate, uh, do uh, some massive parallel, parallel um, amount of operations because of its large dimensionality, which should not fit into a conventional computing architecture. Um, and now this because of this because of having to um, access the memory of large um, strings of data it also create a um, 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 problem with the von neumann bottleneck so um, um, so uh, when we look at the overall picture what we now see is that um, um, the, the both domains so in memory computing and hyperdimensional computing they have amazing set of properties but there are a few um, weaknesses, the drawbacks, is drawbacks from both sides. But uh, the good, thing, good news is that these two um, um, domains are complementing each other so that we can actually use the, the strengths of hyperdimensional computing to um, address the weaknesses on the in-memory computing and vice versa. For example, uh, even though the in-memory computing has um, non-idealities, since hyperdimensional computing is very robust, First, in its in its core, we can um, use this computation um, scroll bars um, and um, help, um, yeah use this um, to um, uh, counteract the the problems that we see in memory computing. Um, yeah, and also when bottleneck because we operate. Uh, where the data is stored itself. So the, the problems we see with the high dimensional commuting, computing as such as having a von Neumann bottleneck is eliminated in this case. Okay, so um, from here, I'd like to present you how a generic HD processing unit would look like. Um, uh, in this generic case, we have a, a set of symbols that are coming from origin space and the, we do a mapping to the high dimensional space, typically a, a dimensionality of 10,000. And this, uh, then we um, uh, perform some operations we call encoding uh, using local set, simple set of local operators like the XOR operator, sum operator, and the permit operator. And then um, we will try to find the closest match in a, in a set of trained data, set of trained hypervectors or the prototype hypervectors which are stored in the, in the associated memory to find the, the outcomes. Now the idea of in memory. HD processing unit, if you look at it uh, step by step, in the step, first step, what we want to do is to um, um, implement the, the in-memory encoding in a memory strip crossbar array. So we um, store the item memory hypervectors um, along uh, the rows of the crossbar. Um, and we have some peripheral, which will interact with the crossbar to perform the encoding operation. 
and in the second step what we'll have is a um, sending uh, the, the result from the first crossbar into a second crossbar uh, where we will already, already had stored the prototype hypervectors along the columns of the array and then we will perform the, the search, the, the SSD memory search operation within the array itself and then the result we can uh, send out uh, from the crossbar array, the classified output. So first we'll now look at the, how the, the in-memory encoder would work in more detail. So the in-memory encoder, uh, the, the goal is to combine the basis hypervectors um, from the item memory to create, in the first case, um, a prototype hypervectors. Um, in the case of language classification, like language class hypervectors. In the case of um, inference, we will, in the second case, in the case of inference, we will create a query hypervector um, for an un unknown language during the inference. So the, the idea of in-memory encoding, uh, in-memory in HD encoding is that we will um, program the, the rows of the, the crossbar um, to, uh, to the item memory hypervectors that we, that we have. So the first row, for example, will represent a hypervector for letter A, the second row can represent letter B, and et cetera. Now we, uh, well, now we in order to do the, the basic operation of encoding, which is called binding, we use a, um, a certain in-memory read logic operation. The idea is that we um, select a certain letter, uh, so a certain row of the crossbar, and then apply a, 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 an, a, an signal on the gate line and then we read out the, the value stored in the, the the that particular row back into the peripheral buffer so in this way we can perform some linear logical operations uh, with the existing value stored in the peripheral buffer and uh, um, some data stored already in the uh, in the in the row of the crossbar but we have a problem here. The, the reason is that uh, we could only pro pro perform linear logical operations. But in our original case, we had to we had the XNOR function to perform the binding operation. So how do we find a solution um, to perform encoding with the uh, the available um, in-memory read logic? So the idea here is to perform uh, what we call a midterm expansion of the XNOR function. As you would know, um, uh, an XNOR between two uh, operands like A and B can be uh, expanded like this. So we have a, a A and with B and the complementary A and with B, and then uh, we can now combine them together using an O operator. So the first side, uh, there's a first uh, uh, mean term here, which is A and B. Uh, we see here, uh, we, we, we see here, the, there's no complementary values used. So we call this an all positive mean term. And the second uh, mean term, uh, we call it all negative mean term because we um, have a, a complementary value from the both operands. Now we can expand this idea into three or four or, uh, larger inputs and um, we try to implement this idea in our encoder. So the idea is that now instead of having one crossbar to uh, keep the later hypervectors, we will have two crossbars. One which will only have the, which will have the, the basic Hy basis hypervector as it is, as it is. Um, and in the second crossbar, we will store the, the complementary values of the, the basis hypervectors. And now we will uh, uh, we'll, uh, show an example how uh, this encoder works. So let's say we would want to uh, create the engram represent representation for the letters I, C, H. So in the original um, equation, we have a double double permuted I uh, bind with uh, permuted C bind with H. Now we try to approximate it uh, two min terms like this. So in the first crossbar, we try to produce um, double permute I and with double permute C and with H. In the second crossbar, double permute I complement and with the uh, permute C complement, permute H complement. So in the beginning, um, we have, um, um, empty peripheral buffer, we apply um, all ones on the gate lines and we select the letter I 
the row that correspond to letter i on both crossbars and in the end of the first cycle we will um, receive to the peripheral buffer the the, the value of the letter i um, and on the right crossbar we re receive the value of complementary i and uh, in go to the second cycle we will um, apply uh, on the get get lines we apply the the results already stored on the peripheral buffer with the one right shift operator so then this uh, will select only the gate lines where we had a, a, a value one in the previous cycle and on the same time we will select a letter second letter which is letter c in this case um, which will um, receive this value at the end of the second cycle on the first crossbar and the, this value here onto the second crossbar on the right in the third cycle we will now select the third letter which is h and, and similar as in the previous cycle we will apply the, the the content of the peripheral buffer with one right shift operator uh, onto the gate lines and then we will receive the, the results back through the bit line to the cross uh, to the peripheral buffer so in the peripheral buffer now we have the the two min terms we were originally looking for and this we can now combine using an or operator and send it to the next stage so using this um, method uh, with this approximation we perform some um, uh, some uh, estimations some um, run with some data sets so first we use a language data set which had uh, 22 languages um, and uh, uh, 21000 uh, query sentences so in this data set we were able to uh, observe uh, just one percent drop in accuracy by this approximation and then we looked at a, a news data set which had, which had uh, eight uh, different categories um, and here uh, the drop in accuracy we observed was about seven percent uh, and here the data was a little bit skewed and, and that could have some uh, um, had some issue in, with the in the reducing of the, the accuracy now we look at the, the associative memory search part um, of the architecture and here the goal is to find a, a class in this case the language uh, to which the query sentence belong um, so we have the the learned prototype hypervectors stored as the the conductance states of the memory cross by array uh, along the the columns of the cross by array um, and uh, in, so now uh, so we tried to approximate the Hamming distance um, that was originally used for the, the distance measurement using a, a binary dot product operation which is more hardware friendly in the case of in-memory computing so if you expand the Hamming distance um, formula you would see there are two components to it two uh, dot product components um, so what, what we're doing is we are trying to um, trying to um, see if one dot product component uh, whether it can give us um, sufficient results sufficient accuracy results so we um, did some experiment with the the language data set the news data set as well as a third data set which is uh, relating to um, um, emg biomedical emg signals so in these all three cases what we um, observed is that uh, drop in accuracy uh, when we use the binary dot product was uh, less than one percent so based on this um, uh, observation we implemented this um, uh, associative memory search um, on a, a the prototype hyper uh, prototype pcm chip available at our lab um, with the naive placement we uh, actually observed uh, about 15 percent accuracy drop especially because of the spatial variation that the conductance values um, um, demonstrate in the, the pcm chip so in order to get rid of this problem we um, performed a what we call a coarse grain randomized placement of the hd vectors so the idea is that they learn prototype vectors instead of storing them in order we will uh, segment this, them into sub vectors and then randomly place them um, across different special locations of the array when we use this method we were able to achieve actually 
um, almost the same accuracies that we saw in the software. So, uh, so this is uh, the final um, a fully complete HD computing system that we propose with the, the three crossbars, two for the uh, in-memory encoding and one with partitions for the associative memory search. Um, and this, uh, these are the experimental results that we obta obtained um, when, when we, we use this PCM chip uh, available at the lab. Um, for both the encoder and the PC, uh, for the associative memory search, it occupies up to 700,000 devices of the PCM chip. And these are the accuracy, um, comparative accuracy uh, degradations that we observe in these two data sets uh, compared to the software uh, when we implement in the, uh, both the uh, associative memory and the item memory in PCM. And we went on to do some energy uh, study comparing our proposed approach with the PCM crossbar arrays to a, a fully custom CMOS, uh, CMOS architecture. Um, what we see is that uh, overall, we can achieve about six times higher energy efficiency with the proposed PCM based architecture. Uh, but if you look at more closely the associated memory search, it can give us more than 100 times better energy efficiencies. Um, yeah, so uh, overall the, the results are uh, somewhat um, diluted because of the uh, energy we spend on the peripherals. So some work we're looking at is to improve the peripherals uh, in the future. So this is the, the prototype experiment chip that we use for our work. Um, and, and now I have a small demonstration video which shows how the, uh, yeah. Yeah, the the link is here. Let me check if I can quickly show you. Yeah. So here we demonstrate an example of language recognition application developed based on our experimental PCM platform. So we use hyperdimensional computing to determine the language of a query sentence written using the Latin alphabet. First, we enter the query sentence through this interface. And uh, a part of the PCM array, which is pre-programmed with the hypervectors of the letters in the Latin alphabet, is used to compute a query hypervector for the query sentence. And now this hypervector is compared against 22 different potential European language profile hypervectors stored in another part of the PCM array. And the resulting language, which is the highest similarity, is finally returned to the host computer and displayed on the screen, as you can see here. So yes, so I would like to wrap up, um, sorry, my talk here. So the these are the key messages of this um, talk. So HD computing is a quite promising brain inspired model, which offers us fast, robust and transparent learning. Um, and uh, there's uh, nice properties in HD computing, which makes it amenable to the imperfections that HD uh, in-memory computing has. And here we present a complete in-memory HD computing system. Uh, with hardware friendly approximations, innovations that allows us to achieve near software equivalent accuracies. And there is, of course, uh, room for improvement with CMOS and peripheral circuits. Um, also, with uh, the type of memory C device that we want to use. Yeah, so this work has been recently been published in Nature Electronics, uh, for which I am quite happy. Um, um, yeah, and then I also have a nice cover uh, featured in the Nature Electronics, which try to um, try, try to um, illustrate the, the the ideas from both the domains. So we see the, uh, the 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 orthogonal representations of the vectors with these perpendicular um, bars, and then inside that you see the the devices. Some of them are um, defective, but still being able to work well. Yeah, so yeah, thanks very much um, um, everyone for your attention. So uh, if there are any questions, I'd like to answer them. Gitan, thank you very much for your uh, talk. Uh, so interesting indeed. So uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah, so <clears throat> I've got one question. Um, so how, how, how does the, do you compute the Hamming distance using your device or, or are you doing that in CMOS off the chip? We do this using the device, uh, the memory steel devices, right? So the 
what we have is a, a approximation version of the Hamming distance. So we so the Hamming, Hamming distance what you have is a XNOR of the component wise XNOR and then um, summing up the result, right? So uh, so we try to expand the component wise XNOR into um, um, two um, and operations, one with the, the original uh, vectors and the other with the, the complementary vectors. What we first try to do is uh, just using um, one part of it here. So the, uh, the binary dot product basically, how many accurate, how much accuracy we can get. So already we could get quite decent accuracy as same as the Hamming distance. So what we did was we stick to the, having uh, one part of the binary dot product. I mean, we want, if we want, we could also have the second part of uh, the binary dot product implemented on a second cross by array, but we felt it was not necessary because we get already decent accuracy. Okay, so the, the Hamming distance is summing, you're summing across the crossbars here. Exactly. The yeah, HD so see, these so are the HD converter is the, is the thing that determines the, the, so you've got some threshold to determine. Exactly. Okay. Right, yeah, it. so we use a, a analog to digital converters here. So, um, so we, when we sum up the currents, um, instead of uh, using a sense amplifier to uh, cut it to a, a digitized a binary digit version, we will use an, an, an analog to digital converter to get a, um, um, an, a, a code which is 10 bit code, which we can then um, use for um, comparison in the second stage. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah, so that so I just want to make sure I understand that, Keitham. So that summation there is is an analog summation of exactly. the exactly. Yeah, yes. Okay. okay. We we use the commercial flow uh, to sum up the current. So basically, when yep. we apply volt, yeah, a voltage, the the conductance determine how much current it's drawn into the bit line, uh, and mm. since the, all the devices are active, so it will. Um, since the gate line is active for all, uh, it will determine how much current is drawn based on the conductance. And then uh, along the bit line, all the currents are summed already. And then we have an integrator for the given period of time. And then this result is sent to the ADC. Okay. So does that, so I'm wondering if you, if you had sparse bit vectors, so mostly zeros and, and a few ones could it be. Would have, uh, we are actually experimenting on that front. So to have a sparse representation, it would have also helped out with, with our binary dot product. But in this uh, uh, result that we show here, we have the dense representation. So 50% zeros and 50% ones. Hmm. Yeah. So, so how does how does um execution speed and and memory capacity compare with with more conventional you know like doing it in a gpu for example um so here we can um, go up to um, so the memory capacity wise we can go up to 1 million devices uh, 1000 by 1000 arrays the, the typically the, the the size that we can now have in the latest technologies um, so which which will uh, which will easily will uh, enable us to uh, accommodate all all the devices we want to have uh, in one crossbar um, because in this case we used only 700, 700, 760 thousand devices so we can put all of them in one crossbar uh, in terms of the 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 speed we we can perform a one um, um, one metric multiplication operation within a microsecond. This is uh, the the time uh, that it takes for uh, this operation of uh, for, for the first for the uh, thousand by thousand array we, uh, for the matrix multiplication operation. It takes um, a one microsecond time. So compared to the GPU, these are the the to the tops values are higher than a GPU when we uh, operate at the, the the best best scenario. Okay. Okay. Thanks. 
Uh, Gitan, if I uh, may ask you uh, another question. So yeah. can you uh, hint us on uh, how the performance scales uh, with the increasing number of entries? So if you have not 21, but I don't know, 21,000 or 21 million entries to search through? Yeah, so uh, you're talking about the associative memory, right? Yes. Yeah, so... Um, so uh, in the associative memory, um, yeah, in this case, when we have a, a more classes, as you mentioned, then we'd have to split it, the, the distribute the, the classes um, across different arrays. Um, it's one way to look at it. Uh, the other way would be to, um, yeah, either we have to spread the classes across arrays or um, have some, part of the, the vectors from all the arrays uh, or from all the classes in one array and then uh, have the other part of the, the vector from all the classes in another array. So this kind of uh, methodology we can do. But but, the, uh, the, the, accuracy, the accuracy of the search will be um, somehow different or it will be uh, constant as one would expect, uh, expect on, you know. So uh, when plans. we have, uh, when let's say we have a, um, um, so the size of the array we have a limit is right now is a thousand by thousand, which means we can, if our uh, vector dimensional, if we can have it at thousand level of a mm. thousand components, we can have thousand classes easily in one array. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the maximum we can do uh, without sacrifice, without compromising our accuracies. Mm -hmm. If you want to have add, to have add more classes, well, then what we can do is we can perform the the in-memory part up to thousand by thousand, and then digitize the results, and then co compute the uh, at the comparisons in the next stage in digital um, uh, part of a subsystem. So this will allow us to have the same accuracy uh, um, and still perform um, all the critical operations in the in-memory co computing crossbar. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, uh, do we have any more questions from the audience? So, so is there a technical, what's the technical challenge of having even bigger chips? Uh, so the thing is that, as you can see here in, in this experiment, the chip, which is a kind of a, a old generation chip. So already you see some special variable uh, variability, which is very uh, clear in here. So as you increase the size of the, the um, array, which we have in one chip, we will um, get into the problems with uh, uh, things like uh, IR drop, drop, we call it. And that means uh, we would not have the same voltage level um, for each device here. And uh, actually what happens is due to parasitics of the, the word lines and the bit lines, uh, the, the voltage will start to uh, drop as it goes, um, um, propagates along the word line, right? So if you apply a point to voltage, it won't be the same at this level, at this point. So these are the type of problems that prevents us from increasing uh, the, the size of the crossbar. But of course, there's some uh, research parallelly going on at the device level to make it more amenable to the, the uh, these kind of non-idealities non and also uh, being able to compute at even sub-threshold voltages, which would help us to um, even scale the size of the arrays even further. But what I'm saying is with the current technology we have, uh, what we can go to is up to thousand by thousand arrays. And this is all, this is, is all CMOS, is it? Or what, what's the technology? So, um, so the this is integrated in back end of the line um, in the CMOS. So the peripherals, uh, which are uh, which you see here, are uh, built in uh, 90 nanometer CMOS. Uh, but the devices themselves, they are made from the PCM um, materials. Um, so it's integrated in the in the CMOS technology. That's right. Okay. Okay. So has anyone thought about, <coughs> about looking at something like Gallium Arsenide as a... Excuse me, I didn't get that. Has, have you, has anyone thought about using something other than CMOS, like Gallium Arsenide? Um, so the, the, the devices are uh, not CMOS, so they, they are phased oh. in, so for no, example... But, but the losses are probably because of the CMOS rather than the devices themselves. 
So, ah, okay. Yeah, so um, I wouldn't be able to comment on that side. So um, about this integration, um, uh, these um, things I'm not so familiar with. Um, yeah, sorry okay. about that. Okay, no problem. All right, so it looks like we are approaching the end of this webinar. So thank you very much to both speakers, to Hob and Gitan, uh, for excellent presentations. And thank you very much for attending this um, uh, webinar, everybody. Uh, so I want to remind you all that this is the last session uh, of the uh, spring or summer series of the webinar. So I'm uh, working on compilation of the new exciting program for, for the fall. So I will uh, keep you updated uh, in the mailing list. So thank you very much and uh, have a great summer.